Somebody asked me, whose dress is that? And I was about to say mine when I realized that was not what they meant by the question. Mm -hmm. Whose dress is that? Mm -hmm. Apparently meant designer. Uh Um, Answer was, I don't know. Uh But I'm tempted to ask, whose dress is that? I have the same reply. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, You could look at the tag in the back. It was designed in the 50s. Where'd you get it? I got it in a thrift store, uh, thrift store, a thrift store on Lancashire in the valley, right next to um, the place where my band rehearses. There's all these junk stores. That's not junk. I know. That's a I great, couldn't believe it. A I great said, dress. Thanks. White that cost about five dollars. Five dollars. Mm-hmm. That's disgusting. I know. Why fifties? Ah. Why, why, I just saw it, and I loved the color and everything. I thought it was incredible. It was a little big on me. I've had it fitted to me. So, What, do, what kind of reaction does it get from people? This dress? Yeah. They want to know where I got it. They think it's great. So mine is a very common reaction. Yeah, but I don't wear it every day, so it's not like something that happens to me over and over again. <laughs> this is certainly not the dress you, you would have worn even a, a, a couple of years ago. You were a totally different look then. Yeah. Now, is this <laughs> you have changed, or is this more like um, a business decision that this is a new look? So what what is it? I think it's a combination of everything. I think when, um, when my first records came out, the clothes that I, were we- that I was wearing at the time were clothes that I'd been wearing for the past few years in New York, and it was a combination of things that friends of mine had designed in New York, like Lower East Side designers. And my girlfriend, Mary Paul, had designed all the jewelry and the crucifixes and stuff. And all my friends were wearing all the bracelets and all the necklaces. And and it was very inexpensive also. So, I mean... From your struggling dancer days. Yeah. It's clothes I could afford and clothes I could get for free. I was reading at one point, you couldn't decide what to do it. You had more hair and you tied up. Oh, yeah, that was the hose in your hair. Yeah, my hair, I cut my hair off and then my hair was growing out and kept getting in my face. And then one day I just took a pair of tights because I didn't have a headband, tied it around my head and it looked sort of like a bow. And then I went out some to some club and someone kept staring at my head. And they said, do you have a pair of tights in your hair? Or, you know, I said, yeah. There, I guess the tag, the Capuzio tag is showing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, but everything was kind of rag bag sort of approach. So I can't imagine you in that anymore. Look at the way you're sitting. You are so elegant and you are just. Well, it depends, you know, when I'm wearing a pair of ripped up jeans and t shirt, I sit differently than this. I can't really move in this dress, so I have to sit this way. <laughs> You had to tell me that. <laughs> Which all? Well, these are, these kind of dresses, you know, clothes make you, make you. I mean, they make your but your 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 body responds differently to what you're wearing. What does that says it say about women in the fifties who were wearing dresses that made them look great but feel kind of uncomfortable and spiked heels and the, and the whole number? Um, well, I think it made them kind of feel breathless <laughs> so, and that was what was so sexy about it you know because you're you're kind of constricted and everything was you know your tits were sticking out and your everything your diaphragm was pressed in and everything was kind of like that you know and the mystery was let this woman out of here exactly mm. but you are an 80s woman uh-huh in a 50s dress so what is this new equation Equal. That equals me. I, you know, I don't have a name for it. Did you get tired of seeing yourself running around in all over America? Everybody looked like uh-huh. Madonna for Oh, a while. yeah, definitely. I, after a while, I started feeling like I was copying myself. So I was like, oh, I have to change my clothes. And then I had money and I could buy nice clothes. So, Like a $5 dress for exactly. the 50s. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I could ask, you know, I could get nicer clothes. More elegant, so. Is it like playing dress up a little bit? Yeah, but it was like playing dress up then, too. Like, is playing dress up something you like to do? I like to play different characters, yeah. Is this because you're an actress or because you're kind of a little girl liking to play dress up? It's because I'm 
a little girl who likes to play dress up who's also an actress. <laughs> you have been a major, you are a major star, we can stipulate that, mm -hmm. big, international. But you have been a star for not long enough for anybody really to know much about you. Really? Oh, yeah. I feel like everybody knows everything there is to know about me. Why? You don't do that many interviews. I do tons. I've done tons of interviews. I feel like, you know, I mean, um, I haven't done a lot of television, but I've done a lot of press interviews. So, so why time haven't and life you? and, you know, people, and I just feel like people have read a lot about me. You haven't done a lot of television interviews. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. doing this television interview. But why haven't you? Why have you seen, you've really avoided it. I don't know. I guess I don't. I don't watch television that much, so um, no offense. That's okay. I, I just don't, and I never really liked the idea of doing it. I don't, somehow I feel that television makes people, it, it's not flattering to people. I'd rather go see someone in a movie, you know, widescreen technicolor, or read about them and see still photographs. Movies, funny you should mention it. Who is that girl starring... Madonna as Nikki Finn. Mm -hmm. Nikki Finn is not this woman I'm sitting across from. I mean, obviously, she's a character you play in a movie, but why did you want to play this character, Nikki Finn? And what's she, who is she about? Because she's funny and she's sweet and she's tough and she's street smart and she's vulnerable and lots of interesting personality traits. Was there something of, of her in you in an earlier time in your life? Mm. Maybe not necessarily an earlier time, maybe any time in my life, but I identified with her character to a certain extent. What aspects of her character did you identify with? Um, she was, she's resourceful, and, and she's funny, and I think I'm funny. And she's smart. I mean, I don't, you know, there are certain things about her that, that, that I can relate to, and, but obviously I never would have um, found myself doing four years in jail. So. No, you've not done any time. <laughs> um, she's a thief. How yeah. come she hadn't been Well, she's not really a thief. She just... I mean, she's happened? not really a thief. I think <laughs> what happened is she came to New York City from Philadelphia and she just to hang out with the wrong crowd of people. I mean, her, her boyfriend happened to be a small-time thief and she was kind of in on it because of association. She didn't really do anything. She just learned stuff through him. Seen in a movie where she's lifting... Yeah. Uh, cassettes. Maybe yeah. she's stealing she a lot of cassettes. I really learned that from her boyfriend. Yes. It wasn't her fault. She was a victim of circumstance. Yeah. It's just business then. It's exactly. Um, it's not a, she's, you like this woman. Yeah. And that's you the other thing. Like her. Does it bother you that, 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 that audiences who will like her might also say, well, she's a thief in it? No, I don't think that they'll even think about the fact that I'm breaking the law right and left. That's what's so great about her, that she's just, she is breaking the law and doing all these crazy things, but somehow you forgive her while she's breaking everything that she gets in the way of, or that gets in her way. Your co-star, Griffin Dunn, is he your co-star? Yes. All right. Not that I forgot his name. I just didn't remember how the titles went. But uh -huh. this is television, so my parts my of star. When I get stupid in an interview, I get uh -huh. cut out, so it's okay. Okay. Um, how about me? Oh, we only want your good parts too. Oh, good. I don't want to. I don't want your bad parts. <laughs> we have a little bit amount of time on my television program, exactly. so I don't put the bad parts. It makes me look bad too. Right. Best you could do, Jane. So not to worry. Griffin Dunn, your co-star, mm -hmm. describing working with you mm -hmm. on the set between takes, mm -hmm. would find himself as as he described it, saying to himself, "Who?" is that girl, mm -hmm. to quote the title of right. the movie. So I'm tempted to ask that, too. Well, Not about the, Nikki Finn, but about Madonna. So for, for me, for Griffin Dunn. Mm -hmm. who, what, you want to know about her, me or the cat? You. No, no, Madonna, you. Oh, well. That would be giving all the mystery away. I'm sur I'd be glad to explain my character in the movie. But I think Griffin was asking that question because... When we first met and we'd have our meetings and stuff, I think I was fairly low key. And then when we got on the set and I got into character, I mean, my character has 
nonstop energy. And she's extremely loud and chatty and talkative. And she's just like this human fireball. And I had to maintain that energy all the time, even in between takes. So I think I drove him a little bit insane. He said, he said that you were a very noisy girl. Yes. <laughs> but, I, but I'm supposed to drive him insane in the movie, so it works. Yeah. Mystery. Uh, yes, I, mystery is an important component in in your career, maybe your life, but certainly your career. And I don't want you to give all the secrets away. But in any good mystery, there are clues. Mm -hmm. What are some of the clues that that might describe who Madonna is? Hmm, that's a tough question. I'm not a man. Huh? <laughs> That's a clue. <laughs> All right. Where did you come from? I came from Michigan. Where in Michigan? Well, I was born in Bay City. Bay uh, City? Yeah. Little town? Mm-hmm. Small town? Little smelly town in northern Michigan. Um, Why do you say smelly town? Because they had, it was like a chem, it was like New Jersey. There was a lot of chemical um, dumps there or something. Yeah. So, so do you say little smelly town with some affection or with complete dis no, no. taste? Or no, I have great affection for Bay City. Um, and then I grew up in Pontiac and other suburbs um, around Detroit. And then I moved to New York. Can you figure that out? Why, someone who is arguably, and I have seen this in print, mm -hmm. the biggest star in the world today, mm -hmm. came from Bay City, Michigan. <laughs> well, was that possible? James Dean came from some small town in Indiana. I mean, I don't think you got to come from a, you know, big cosmopolitan city. To Obviously don't. We could probably sit here and come up with a, a, a much longer list than yeah. Don and James Dean. Yeah. And it interests me, too, that James Dean came from a little town in Indiana. Yeah. How does that happen? How does great talent? I think a lot of it has to do with imagination and the great desire and need to get out of that small town kind of feeling and go somewhere and be somebody because you feel like you're missing something. All those people, those kids grew up, go to the New York School for the Performing Arts. All of those kids who go to Los Angeles and they're child stars and they're talented. Right. They didn't get to be the among the biggest entertainers in the world today. But but this little girl grew up from Bay City, Michigan, and somehow Well, they're not Disney. as driven as I am. Probably um not as hungry as I was for it, you know. Do you know why you of all the other kids in Bay City, Michigan. Bay City, Michigan, to my knowledge, hasn't produced anybody else. And presumably there were some hungry other people. Well, what Pontiac or more, even more driven. You know? I think coming from a big family, you know, has something to do with it. You know, eight brothers and sisters and, you know, wanting, you know, that sort of competitiveness you have when there's a whole bunch of you and you want your parents' attention. And you want you don't want the hand me down clothes. You you know what I mean. You want to stand out. You want to be treated special. And and then also my mother dying. I think that had a lot to do with me saying, well, you know, after I got over my heartache, um, saying, well, you know, I'm going to be really strong then. Or if I can't have my mother, I'm never going to be. I'm never going to. I'm going to, you know, take care of myself. How old were you when your mother? Six and a half. That's plenty old enough to know and remember your mother, yeah. isn't it? Mm. What was she like? She was um, beautiful and very loving and devoted to her children, very children oriented. She died of cancer. Mm -hmm. Long, a long illness? Um, two years, I think, approximately. I wonder about about that. If when a tra trauma happens in a little girl's life mm -hmm. like that, do you think I'm here? I'm, I'm psychology. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think that to a degree, that six and a half year old girl 
stopped, froze in development, and that somewhere in your character there's, a, there's still that, that same little girl? There's so much little girl about you, that vulnerability, even a little playfulness. It's not all a tragic. Yeah, but I don't think you have to have a, a you know, I don't think you, one of your parents needs to die for you to maintain a childlike quality in yourself. I think certain people let it stay and certain people kill it when as they grow older. Okay, if it's not the childlike quality mm -hmm. that driven, what made you different from... from well, like else? I think, as I said before, a hunger and a desire to find something to take the place of my mother, you know. I think maybe that might have made me separate or different. It's like, um, like they make rare... Um, uh, metalloids or mm -hmm. elements that are forged mm -hmm. in high heat and pressure. Yeah. Maybe something like that happened to you. You were born with gifts, beauty, yeah. talent. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, maybe not a lot, but people are born with talent yeah. and beauty. But something happened mm -hmm. and something special emerged. Right. Mm. Do I overanalyze or no? No. But usually, a tragedy makes you stronger. So, you are whatever does whatever what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You're strong. You you, you are a strong person. I mean, that certainly is you. You give off strength. You yeah. really do. But mm -hmm. one never knows if that is is a cover up. A cover up. Yeah. Um. I think some of it is. You know. I think I have as many vulnerabilities as I have strengths. But the strengths usually overpower the weaknesses, <laughs> hopefully. In your household, as you grew up and with lots of brothers and sisters, and a father who was an engineer, mm -hmm. college-educated, white-collar, mm -hmm. so if you weren't wealthy, you were middle class, mm -hmm. and a father with strong values, yes. right? Yes. Um, Catholic schools? Yeah, until my last few years of high school. I went A's on your report cards? Yeah, I was a good student. Um, when did the rebellion and the little flashes of it begin? Well, just because I was doing good in school doesn't mean I was rebelling against my parents. I wanted to do good in school, um, but wanting to wear dresses above my knees and wear lipstick and go out on dates with boys was considered rebellious as in my family. What were some of the gestures of rebellion that you recall? Something that I did? Yeah. Oh, um, well, I would, when I would go to school dressed a certain way. Or I, no, I would come down to um, breakfast dressed very modestly and eat my breakfast, and I would go back upstairs and borrow a girlfriend's mini skirt and put that on and then put my winter coat on over it and go to my bus stop. and. And, and my stepmother would think that I was dressed a certain way, and I wasn't. And then I'd go in the bathroom and put tons of makeup on, mm -hmm. you know. So that was... No. And then I'd wash it all off before I went home. Another of your reputations, very ill-defined, mind you. Mm -hmm. They say you're a tough businesswoman. Mm -hmm. You have a good head for contracts <laughs> and so forth. Do you mean I read them? <laughs> You have the impression you write them. <laughs> no. I couldn't have that boring job. I mean, I never want to be the person that writes up all those things. But do you trust your business affairs to other people, or do you do it? you got to have hands Well, I have on. business managers, and I have managers, and I have lawyers, and I have agents, but I... Do they bother always, you with details? They have to. I insist. I call them up all the time and annoy them. Why? What are you protecting? I just want to know what's going on. I want. I make a lot of money. I want to know where everything's going. Is is the money important? It's not important. Like, oh God, I have to have a lot of money. But I know lots of people in my position um, have a lot of money, and somehow it gets lost somewhere, and nobody knows where it went. <laughs> you know. So, where? None of your business question, but where is your money? I mean, do you do you have big house, big car? It's in lot. It's in lots of different bank accounts, and I have you know several different corporations. 
and I have a house in Malibu and an apartment in New York. And um, I do a lot of charity work and help out that way as much. Philanthropy, as you give money away. Yeah, and I buy art and and. Um, well, st- stop a minute. Blah, um, blah 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 blah. Let's stop there, and we'll go go backwards. What kind of art do you like? Um, I like art deco, art nouveau. Um, see, like constructivist, cons- constructivist, Russian constructivist. Yeah, um, I have a lot of lampikas. She's my favorite painter. Philanthropy. Who? Are, what are your philanthropies? Who, what, what? Well, I know you did an AIDS benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly, um, I give money to um, cancer research and. Um, um, trying to think of other things, cancer research, AIDS research, um, aid to Nicaraguans. Um, we're got side. you have just Melissa Sheen. I love it. Which side of the Nicaraguans? I I'm I'm an anti Contra, so Sandinista. Yep. That none of you pays <laughs> Fair answer. I'm certainly not going to get into that discussion. You're on a tour, and mm-hmm. it's no coincidence mm-hmm. that, or maybe it is a coincidence, but I don't think it is, that you're on a, a, a big tour, well-publicized, mm-hmm. highly successful, and the movie comes out. How does that work? Um, or the career, do you manage, uh, do you time, do you... And, and I'm back. I'm back in in in, in exploring somehow Madonna as uh, yeah somehow president and chairman of the board. It just all kind of works out. I mean, it's not calculated. Not particularly. I mean, it's like my last tour. It just so happened that after I'd made my my like a virgin album, I got the part in Desperately Seeking Susan. And then when this when the movie was coming out, I was ready to do my tour. So it all happened at once. And the same thing happened again. After I made Shanghai Surprise, I came back and finished my second, my True Blue album, released the album, and as soon as that happened, the part for the part for Who's That Girl came. So I did that, and then I wanted to go on tour again. So I worked to go on tour as soon as I was done with the movie, and then it sort of coincided that the movie was coming out with the tour coming out, but it wasn't calculated. Which is paramount with Madonna, the movie or the tour? They're equally important. We started life as an Alvin Ailey dancer. Mm-hmm. Right, we didn't start as an Alvin Ailey. One works up to that because one is good. Uh, why did you give up dancing? I didn't. I danced my ass off in my show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but you don't think of yourself first and foremost as a as a dancer. As a dancer. I mean, at no. some point you decided. No, but it certainly has helped me in everything that I've done. So I've, I've never really given it up. Yeah, I would take any of the bricks out of the foundation you've yeah. laid by no means. Yeah. But, well, but, that is like, what it is, a foundation that I built, and I just use it. Where did you go from dancing? What was the next step? Singing. Drumming? Oh, well, um, yeah, playing drums in a band and then learning how to play guitar and then writing songs and then singing and and then making videos and then acting. Yeah, it's a long list. Yeah. I feel like I'm interviewing you. This is a congressional testimony, and I'm laying my case. And the point I want to make is there's a, I think, a bad rap on you that... There's probably several. Yeah. What are the other ones? Well, you tell me what you're in this. And you'll tell me one? Maybe. Okay. That you are basically a a one-note Madonna. Mm -hmm. Your voice is is good, but you are a phenomenon. Mm Mm-hmm. Fact is, you are in, you're kind of a multi-talented, uh, a, a more than a triple threat, aren't you? To whom? A triple threat. That means somebody who can sing, somebody who can uh-huh. dance, somebody who can act uh-huh. on Broadway. Right. That's that's what you want to find. Mm-hmm. Someone who can do who can do it all. Right. And you can say, yeah, I can do that. And I can also drum. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's a bad rap? Do you get a bad rap? I mean, never mind. You get you crying all the way to the bank. <laughs> yeah, but right. still. 
do I think I get a bad rap? I think that I'm misunderstood, but I think that's okay. I don't expect everyone to get everything that I'm about. It's part of the mystery. Exactly. And that way people keep discovering things and, you know. You're not wounded then by such criticism as that? No. What did Mick, Mick Jagger said something awful, dumb. I mean, his implication was Madonna is dumb. Maybe it was mm -hmm. Madonna's lyrics were dumb, not Madonna. Mm -hmm. No, I remember reading it somewhere, too. Yeah, what'd you think of that? Um, I thought some it? thoughts I wouldn't say on television. Have you since forgiven yes, that, him? Or? Oh, of course I have. I, yeah, I've, I met him after he said it. What'd you say to him? Nothing. I mean, talked about other things. I didn't. You think he changed his mind? Did I change his mind? Yeah. I don't really feel he felt that way when he said it. I think he was feeling my threat. So he said it. All right. I said one. You say one. What are some of the other bad raps? <laughs> Wait, that... I think you sort of covered them all, though. I mean, my bad rap is that I'm not really that talented, that I just have a penchant for you know, having a good, public, good publicity kind of thing around me. Um, well, um, obviously that's not true. So I don't, I think, I think an image and, and like a good hook gets you in the door, but something has to keep you in the room. And um, other bad reps, mm. I think that's the main thing. You know, yeah, I'm a gold digger or an opportunist, whatever. Well, yeah, I forgot that. Yeah. Was that Rolling Stone? Yeah, yeah, I think so. What's that story, the opportunist? How? What case did they make? Oh, that I stepped all over people on my way to the top kind of a thing. You did make a remark once that you got to keep moving. Yeah. And you can't take everybody... You can't take everybody with you. Exactly. Is that opportunist or is that what everybody That's does? what, you know, it's whatever you want to call it, you know. I think that, um, to me, the uh, definition of an, uh, being an opportunist is someone who seizes the moment and gets the most out of what they can. And, you know, certainly never having the intention of hurting anyone. What about the little people? Are there little people that you've forgotten along the way? I'm sure there are, but there's too many people in the world for me to be remembering them, remembering them all the time. And, and the people that I do remember are the people who are worth remembering. You say that with a steely, cool glint in your eye, and I don't think you're that cold. I'm not cold, but it's true. I mean, you've met a lot of people along the way to where you are, right? But do you call them all and send them all postcards and Christmas presents and stuff? People have implied that you should. Well, I mean, isn't that what you're implying, that I'm cold because I say that I can't, I can't remember everyone? I mean, the, the people who really mean something to me and who are going to enhance and enrich my life as I grow are the people who, who are or are still around me. And the other people are people that I've gotten what I could possibly get from them, and I appreciate that, or they're people who I could never have gotten anything out of, really, uh, or, you know what I mean? That's just the way life is. A couple years ago, how are we doing? No. Oh, I'm sorry. A couple of years ago, you were on the, never mind Rolling Stone, the cover of Time mm -hmm. magazine. Mm -hmm. Is your su success ever scary? I mean, is the air mm. thinner up there in the stratosphere? Yes, it is. Because I know that lots of people are paying attention to me and watching my every move. And I think I, I, I feel it more than ever now because I'm doing stadium shows and I get up on stage and I see 65,000 people all standing there and all of a sudden I feel like, you know, I have a big responsibility. It's not stage fright. No, you're talking about no. It's like it's just seeing that many, knowing that you sold a certain amount of records or so many people have bought in this magazine is much different than seeing that all in one room and feeling their presence and knowing that they want 
some, they're there to get something from you. And there are times when you don't quite feel equal to that pressure? Not, th not that I can't do it, but just, wow, you know, I have a big responsibility. Look what I've done. You know? Do you like people to look at you? Mm, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you always have your ugly days. Or you have a big zit, you know, on your face, and you're like, not I don't want people. Oh, yes. Ask my makeup artist. It's not in your contract, is it? <laughs> to have zits. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> well, you just have a, you know, bad day. You know, you don't feel great. So if people are looking at you when you walk down the street, you don't want them to. But they do anyway. Exactly. That's part of the package. Right. Irony. The man in your life can't stand it. Right. It's not that he can't stand being looked at. He just likes privacy. He's a very private person. There was a columnist who wrote what, in effect, was a public lecture mm -hmm. to your husband. Right. And people like him <laughs> who think they can play the star game right. by their rules. Right. The case she made, do you remember what, you know what I'm talking about? The case she made was that if you want to be a star, you owe it to your fans. Mm-hmm. To you owe it to the paparazzi, whatever, to the people who make stars happen and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to play by that rule, then go sell insurance or something. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? I'm not sure. It depends on who. I, I believe the person. I'm not sure who you saying said this. It depends. Um, well, I mean, it's Liz Smith, and I'm, uh, I may be paraphrasing unfairly is why I didn't I intentionally say I think that there, that. Are, there are certain things you have to accept in this business that you know, you become a larger-than-life figure and people want to know about you and you have to expect a certain amount of of, a, of an invasion, people walking up to you in the streets, um, doing interviews, people wanting to know you, touch you. That uh, You just have to expect a certain amount of it, but then, you know, you have to draw the line. Where do you draw the line? Um, I draw the line when I get to my house <laughs> and I go up my driveway, and that's where the line is, you know. Wherever I live, you know, that, that should be sacred. And my own private life and, you know, my romantic life, that's where I draw the line. Do your fans know that? What? Do they understand that there's a line at all? Mm, I don't think that it occurs them to them to understand. I mean, if you really, really like someone or idolize someone or you you do anything to find out about them and i mean it, it depends certain people go to a lot of extremes i know people hang out at the bottom of our driveway a lot then constantly ring our doorbell and they want to see us they think that we're going to invite them up for a cup of tea or something you know um and then there are other people who who are fans of mine who just write me letters and want my autograph, you know? So there's different kinds of fans. Is it ever frightening? Frightening? Yeah. Sometimes when they're relentless and they never leave you alone. You are so exposed. I mean, look at the picture on your True Blue album, provocative. Juggler vein. The seductress mm -hmm. in your videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do. But the, the, the product, and I don't... I mean, it is a product. That's a, your, the Madonna that we see. Yes. Is so inviting. Mm-hmm. It's dangerous. Yeah. It's for you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm not really afraid of that. It's meant to be provocative, you know? But it's not only meant to be provocative in a sexual way, also in a, thinking in, a, in, in other ways. You know, I don't think about that aspect, you know. I like to provoke people, but I don't think about the danger of it. And if there is a dangerous element, that's exciting to me. I have no intention of, of, of crossing the line you don't want to cross about your romantic life. But it is interesting that, that Sean Penn 
found Madonna, the world's most public mm -hmm. woman, and fell in love with her. And well, opposites attract. Yeah. Do you do you ever try to help him accommodate some of the exigencies, if you will, of of the movie, movie business, or is that his decision? Period. End it, of discussion. Yes, I, that is. I mean, I I don't I. Specific, specifically don't want to discuss Sean and how he handles himself. He is a grown man and he makes his own decisions about that. And when he wants to talk to the public about it, he can do that, but I don't want to. You're very careful about his life, and yet you are available. I see the difference. Well, and I respect it. By me, I can't speak for him. It's not fair. So where are you going next? Well, after I do my sh show in Chicago, I have a show in Madison, and uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and then Ohio, and then Detroit, then New York. And then and Europe. In Europe? Mm-hmm. And then? What, when I ask about the future, how far away is the future? Is that next to winter tomorrow. or tomorrow is the future? Mm -hmm. You don't think beyond that? Well, I've been thinking beyond that, beyond that, beyond that for several years. And, um, I'm I'm relishing the idea of not really doing anything for a month after my tour. Everyone, everybody who knows me right now is going, "Oh, sure, she's going to take a month off." Why? <laughs> why? Why are they so dubious? Because I'm a workaholic. I mean, I I love to work, but I just do one thing after the next. Well, you're lucky, um, and I hope you stay that way yeah. for a career's worth. Mm -hmm. But in your line of work, it's good to take. You time. can only want to work if someone gives you something to do. No, if there's a sorry. concert and and you can sell tickets, if there's a screenplay and they want you for the yeah, but you can create things too. You can make, develop movies and you can work on things like that. You you're not someone who does a picture, sits back and and. Is sure the phone will never ring again? No. Absolutely not. You don't know that most people in, in the well, business I do probably things. do I, have that insecurity? Maybe they do. But I, you know, I write songs. Um, I make records. I, I mean, I, I have... I know this sounds stupid, but I have a multifaceted career, so I mean, I... Don't just sit around and wait, waiting for someone to send me a screenplay. I am developing screenplays for myself as an actress. And I hope to produce movies in the future, and I'm going to continue to write music and make records, so there's tons of stuff to do. And I have to learn how to tap dance. So, Why do you have to learn? Because it's something I don't know how to do, and I want to learn. You didn't learn that back in Kiak? No, can you believe it? No, I can't. So... That's up on my agenda. Do you have time? Oh, well, I'll make time. Where? We I mean, know 24 hours is standard. Well, when I'm done with my tour and I time off, I'll go to, you know, Sally Moses tap dancing school. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to learn how to surf, too. You don't already? <laughs> right? So near Lake Michigan and you never no. Heard? I they don't have big waves in Lake Michigan, but Sean's a really good surfer, and we live in Malibu, and I'm I'm terrified of it, so I want to learn how to do it because I like to do things I'm terrified of. What do you do on your time off? Um, I read and I go to movies, and I eat. What? Everything? Not everything. Well, I'm a vegetarian, right? I ate a whole bag of cinnamon gumdrops last night. <laughs> One after another? Uh-huh. Would you qualify that as a binge? Mm, definitely. Why? Because I ate the whole bag. No, I mean, I know it's a binge, but why did you do it? Because I have a sweet tooth. Yeah. And after after I do a show, I'm ravenously hungry. I should have eaten something healthy, but I didn't. Yeah. Well, I feel like I've... Run the gamut. I've come up against a wall, oh. and I've met 
the Madonna that Madonna wants me to see, right? Sure. And the rest I can only speculate about. Exactly. See, now what you've done is you have perfected the, I will play by the rules and I will give the interviews and I will be available. Mm -hmm. And when they leave, they won't know a whole lot more about me than they did when they came. Are so you sure? have found a way to protect yourself, mm. haven't you? I wouldn't call it protection. It's just letting a little bit out at a time. Are you having fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're happy? Mm -hmm. This is a happy time in your life? Yes. Is it all you dreamed it would be when you were a little girl? No. How could I dream all of this? It's better. It's just bigger than anything I could ever imagine. If I knew how it really was, would I want to trade places with you? Uh oh. <laughs> Why not? Oh, because it's hard work. Because it is. And you have to want to, um, oh, I don't know. I guess you have to really have a very large um, ego and good tolerance for pain. And you have to be addicted to work and keep going and going and going and the pain physical pain dancers everything pain pain all pain pain where's the pain come in oh when 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 you're tired and you're sick and you can't go on stage and you have to or when you um work really hard on something and it doesn't come out the way you wanted it to come out and you put your blood and guts into it for months and months a nice surprise right that's pain, but you learn from it. So it's worth it. But people, and I mean, your fans, every night she gets to sing the song. She already knows the words. So what can I that... I forgot the words. What work can that be? She looks terrific, and what fun to put on great clothes. Yeah, but I work my ass off every day to look terrific. Believe me. What do you do other than eat the cinnamon balls at night and pay the next day? Um. Well... I don't eat them all the time, first of all, and I, I, I have a fairly strict diet. I mean, and that I don't eat any animal products. I don't eat any meat or fish or chicken or dairy products, but I eat everything else. But this is a, you consider this is a, a professional sacrifice? That no, no I want, I want, I've been a vegetarian since I was 15, but I eliminated the dairy products before, when I started training before my show because I have more energy. And the jogging, everybody. And less mucus when I'm singing and stuff. So, and I have a trainer who kicks my ass every day. So. And that's very hard work. It is. Well, I appreciate your taking time with us. Okay. Take care of yourself. Okay. Best to your husband. Thank you. The end. <laughs>